Nostalgia is a bittersweet emotion we experience. When we think back to a past experience that was better than the life we're currently leading. That's from Psychology Today. Oh, that's actually sad. <laughs> People our age are very nostalgic for uh, the 90s decade, which was the last decade before all the distractions came in. If you can capture two different demographics, right? People our age that want to reminisce and look back, and then younger people that want to know what it was like uh, shooting Blossom. There are no like blue collar shows anymore, right? I mean, the Russo family was a very middle class, blue collar family. No one was rich. I mean, now it's like, uh, you know, it's the OC and the housewives and uh, everyone's rich living in, you know, $50 million mansions. I, I feel like it might be time to, <laughs> the pendulum to swing back the other way and represent the rest of the world. Everything's so safe, everyone's so scared. You, I mean, you'll get canceled for saying anything. So isn't it time now uh, for someone to come out with a show that just pushes the envelope a, a little bit I mean, the comedians are the last ones that are really like doing that. Even they're scared. The 90s was coming out of that very conservative time and was like, it's a fun, free expression before social media, before, you know, uh, YouTube and whatever the kids are distracted with today. You know, <laughs> it led to, you know, the blossoms and, uh, you know, friends and all the, you know, the, the great entertainment, the great music that came out in the 90s. And I feel like everyone was happy in the 90s. I, I, I think I was blissfully ignorant for that period of time. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. I'm going to break down a good one today, the entire decade of the 90s, with the help of David Lasher and Christine Taylor. Now, David Lasher played Vinny on Blossom. So if you remember Blossom, you remember David Lasher. And he and Christine Taylor were in this little show called Hey Dude on Nickelodeon literally at the same time that Blossom started. But Christine, you also know from a ton of amazing things. She's had roles in films like Dodgeball, Zoolander, Tropic Thunder, The Wedding Singer. She also played Marsha in the Brady Bunch movie and its sequel. Um, the two of them are super fun together. I was on their podcast and they agreed to come on mine. I'm without Jonathan today, sadly, but we will fill him in on all of the good nostalgia that we talk about today here on The Breakdown. It's really a pleasure to welcome David Lasher and Christine Taylor to The Breakdown. Break it down. Yes! Thank you for having us. So, David, David, you you had expressed that you were worried that you were coming on here to basically have a therapy session with me and talk about childhood trauma. Is that what you think this podcast is? No, let me say I'm a huge fan of your <laughs> podcast and, uh, and of your intellect and how deep you can go with your guests. So I've, I've heard lighter episodes, you know, and I've heard... <laughs> episodes that go into yeah childhood trauma and i'm childhood ready for trauma. whatever we we could do it you know a fun trip down memory lane or we could go deep as you want well sometimes a trip down memory lane <laughs> involves going deep so it might that might involve childhood trauma right exactly sometimes memory lane just <laughs> is trauma <laughs> um thank you both for being here um you collectively have a podcast indeed correct and um, I was on your podcast, and now you are on my podcast. And what's really special about the two of you together is that while I knew in the back of my mind and head somewhere that you had been in a show together when you were younger, when I heard you had a podcast together, I thought, well, that's an interesting pairing. And I thought, I have 
relationships and interactions with both of these people. Because, Christine, I used to watch you in the real-life Brady Bunch, which was the play that obviously became a sensation um, as a movie. But I knew you as, you know, this, like, young actress who did an amazing Marsha Brady. Um, and then I knew that you married Ben Stiller. These are things I knew about you. And then David and I worked together on Blossom. But then when I heard you had a podcast, I thought, well, that's cute that those two people. And then I remembered, oh, wait, you were on a television show together. So tell us what that show was and tell us when it came on. Christine, you want to... <laughs> I was going to say, you should take this one because you were saying Mayim knew nothing about it. Uh, well, yeah. I, <laughs> Which most people didn't. I'll say Mayim, when, when I auditioned for Blossom, I had just done a few episodes of 90210. And I, I, I remember dis distinctly that you had watched those episodes. And I feel like, and I've told Jenny Garth this, I feel like my episodes on on 90210 got me the job on Blossom because you were <laughs> you and I, I think Jenna also were like, oh, my God, we were huge 90210 fans. But Hey Dude was um, a Nickelodeon show, like the first scripted um, live action show. Uh, and we filmed it in Tucson, Arizona, starting in I guess it aired in 1990. We started shooting in 89. And uh, we had no idea what it was. We had really no idea what Nickelodeon was or if anyone was watching. Um, but I, looking back on it, people were watching and there are generations of people that really the show meant a lot to and I'm proud of it. But it was a very uh, trippy bubble we were in, not knowing <laughs> what, we, what we were doing. But Christine, what do you think? I mean, we were, we were all brought out to the middle of Tucson, Arizona. The, the, the premise of the show was a bunch of teenage, teenage kids working on a dude ranch as their summer job. So we were on an actual dude ranch, like sort of, in, you know, we would use some of the real dude ranch for sets, but then they built sets. So we were really literally planted in the middle of, of the desert. Coming from, I came from like middle America, suburbia, Pennsylvania. David, you came from Westchester, New York couple local kids um, from Tucson, right, David? Yeah, someone younger. And then, but we were all East Coast kids and, and actors. Yeah, in, in the middle of high school, too. For people listening or watching who may not really kind of understand the time that we're talking about, Nickelodeon was a station I didn't even get. Like, we still only had three stations in those days. There was CBS, there was NBC, there was ABC, and then there was this, like, weird network, Fox, that was never going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, but this was really the start for many of us of, like, the knowledge of cable. Like, there were stations other than the ones that just were free that just, like, came when you plugged your TV in. But Nickelodeon was known for animation, right? Like, it was not known for live action. You were literally the, the first. Yeah, and they also did game shows too. Like, right? Didn't they do right. like, like, like? Um, you can't you know, do that on television. Exactly. Double Dare was the double, double Dare. Double Dare. That's right. But huh. I think, yeah, we. I think what 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 Nickelodeon became was sort of like the Snapchat of the early '90s, right? It was, there were no parents welcome. The kids felt like they owned it, right? And uh, and and. And every show was kind of like, it's as if a kid wrote it and created right. it. And, and like, it's fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was, they, they, the kids felt like they owned it. If you were eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old in 1990, that was your place to, to uh, enjoy entertainment away from your parents. And that was their thing. And can you talk a little bit, each of you, about sort of where you were before then? I, I don't need to give away ages, but um, if you want to kind of talk about when, just, you know, briefly, just so people can imagine, like, when did you start acting and how long after you started acting did you get cast in this Nickelodeon show? Well, I I was living in the suburbs of Allentown, Pennsylvania, like super middle America. I came up doing my, you know, high school, elementary school shows, community theater, big thing in Allentown. Um, and I was, you know, like in my sophomore year of high school or ending my sophomore year of high school. And, and, a, and a talent manager had seen a, a, a musical, a, a community theater. You'll love this, Mayan. Hmm. Fiddler on the Roof. 
which I did oh, twice no that year. Wait, we did Fiddler on the Roof at my Catholic I'm sorry. school. Directed by She's a an honorary I Jew, knew, I'll tell you I that. I knew Mayim would love it. I knew she would love it. Directed by Father. What part did you play? Java. The rebellious daughter who runs off at the rock. She can't even say Hava and she played uh, we all just went, we went in our. We went with Hava. We went with Hava. Yes. No. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, that I don't think would happen today. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I did. I, we did Fiddler on the Roof. I did Fiddler on the Roof twice and um, twice <laughs> in my life. And that was my experience of. of um, a fiddler, but I, and which is like one of my favorite musicals anyway. But, um, I, a talent manager saw me in one of those shows or one, some other show and said, would you ever be into going to New York and auditioning for commercials? And you know, that whole thing. And we lived, it was a two hour drive from Allentown to New York. Um, and it just started out as like a, why not? who sounds like a fun idea. I auditioned for a Burger King commercial, got that commercial, like the mm. counter girl. And, um, you know, we talked about on our podcast, mine, you were not the commercial girl, right? We talked about your, right. right. How, how, you know, and I was, I was that all American, whatever cookie cutter version of what they wanted to see back then. Right. No, you definitely, you had, and this is not a disparaging comment, you had a beautiful all-American all look. Right, you whatever know? that meant, which was as, as generic as possible. Doesn't, you know, <laughs> doesn't offend, just can say the lines and smile, <laughs> and say two burgers for a buck. Um, and, uh, but then the audition for Hey Dude came fairly soon after that. I mean, it was at a period of time where they, you didn't really have to sign with an agent. You could kind of, you know, freelance wow. with different agents and thing. And Hey Dude came up. I was, a, uh, I think it was right at the beginning of my senior year in high school. And that was, yeah, oh my I graduated. Gosh. I'm a year older than you, David, right? We're, we're yeah. a well, little over a I year. I think one year, yeah. Um, so I was a year older than, than you, but that was it. That was really how quickly it happened. And it was sort of like a, let's just go with this. This was not really the plan, but I'm loving it. I enjoy it. I loved theater. And I was like, why not? Uh, I also started in theater. Um, I did, uh, there was a, a thing called Scarsdale Summer Music Theater. I did two summers. Um, I did uh, uh, Damn Yankees and, uh, and The Music Man. And then I played the prince in um, The King and I at Pleasantville Music Theater. And honestly, whenever I anyone asks me, like, how do I get in the business? Or I, I think I like this. I always say start in theater, even community theater. Like, see if you like it, the camaraderie, the rehearsal, the the bonding, the, you know, being in front of an audience. Um, so I loved it. And um, yeah, one of the plays I did, a manager came down, signed me. And then I spent ninth grade uh, through, well, the, the next few years running around Manhattan, auditioning for commercials. My first job was a Burger King commercial as well with Jerry <laughs> O'Connell, who we right. talked about wow. on, on our podcast. Jerry and I were in a uh, Burger King commercial. Um, and then I got, I, I got a pilot um, uh, my sophomore year. Um, David Hemmings directed it. It was, it did, it, it ended up not going. And I remember feeling like, what do you mean it's not going? Like, I didn't understand what that meant. You know, I had flown to LA six weeks. We shot an hour pilot and then it didn't go. And then the next year I, I flew to LA to uh, test with Alyssa Milano to um, play a role <laughs> on Who's the Boss, her boyfriend. Uh, and <laughs> and, and I, I didn't get that either. And it was, uh, she had been, she, Alyssa had been dating a guy named Brian Bloom and his brother, Scott Bloom, was the kid testing against me. And I didn't know. I, di I didn't know that I had no shot flying there. But, you know, whatever. I, I started in theater and commercials. And uh, and then I guess Hey Dude was really like the first show that actually went with longevity for me. Mind the Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. 
You know, every week, my job is to try and balance my time well between my commitments at work and as a mom and to all the other people in my life while also taking time for myself. But I'm not always very good at that, gonna be honest. It's really easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you without taking time to think about what you need from and for yourself. And if we do that, if we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so that you can keep supporting others and not leave yourself behind. This has been a huge component of my therapy is figuring out where I fit actually in therapy just this very morning. I was talking about this. If you're thinking of starting therapy, please give BetterHelp a try. It's online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You'll get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash break. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by Ritual. You know, they say that giving birth is kind of like running a marathon. Well, how about being pregnant and building a company from scratch to take on the multivitamin aisle? Well, that is the story of Ritual's founder, Kat Schneider, who started Ritual because she couldn't find a prenatal that she could trust. It's super easy to incorporate Ritual products into my daily routine. And I love that they're vegan friendly. That's extremely important to me. Ritual's high quality and traceable key ingredients are in clean bioavailable forms so you can trust what you're putting in your body when it matters most. During pregnancy, their all-in-one formulation with choline and clinically studied methylated folate support your baby's neural tube development and vegan omega-3 DHA support your baby's brain development. These are really important things. Their citrus or mint essence capsules are designed to be easy on the tummy so you can take them when you want, with or without food. Ritual is non-GMO project verified, soy-free, gluten-free, and vegan. Their delayed release capsules are designed for optimal absorption. Why settle for a multivitamin you're not 100% sure about? Ritual was built on trust, so you know it's the real deal. Ritual's offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Where do they go, Jonathan? Visit ritual.com slash breakdown to start Ritual or add Essential for Women prenatal to your subscription today. So what's funny is when I kind of think about the timing and also part of why I may not have been that tuned into Hey Dude was because Blossom started exactly the same time. So we kind of had these like parallel time frames. I met Don Rio in 1989, who created Blossom. And then we started in 90. So David, what year did you then join us? I, I remember doing the season finale of either season one or season two. I can't remember, but it was it was it was like where you ran away with me and we were That's in a right. car. I just remember being my heart pounding out of my chest <laughs> in front of the studio audience and uh, and thinking this is not I, I, I think I'm going to get fired. And <laughs> And they literally <laughs> called, my agent called me the next day. They're like, yeah, they want to offer you a three season deal on Blossom. I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> but yeah, I, listen, it was, it was the greatest experience. And I, I don't know if it was season one finale or season two finale where we ran away together. So you did not film in front of an audience out on a dude ranch in Tucson. It was a multi, multi cam. So, I mean, it, we did have three cameras. <laughs> so we shot it as if it was wow. a, a situation comedy with an audience with jokes. And it was a bunch of sweaty <laughs> guys standing in the blazing sun. Um <laughs> And, you know, we had no sense of what, I mean, you know, David, we talk about it now, but we had such a great team of writers and we had these, you know, I mean, the other thing too, is we were brought out there. Our parents didn't come with us. Excuse me? Excuse no. me? I mean, I was 17, but I wasn't 18. <laughs> and we were brought out there and they gave, they assigned us a legal guardian who was that's right. That's what they used to do in those Who days. Just happened to be the accountant for the Knoxville, Tennessee <laughs> production company. <laughs> was it really? Was Cindy. Yes, yeah, Cindy. She was the accountant. Oh she would give us our per diem. She was also our guardian. Yeah, she gave us she gave us money every week, but she certainly didn't check on our whereabouts. We never or... checked in with her. We never checked in with her. Like, it wouldn't fly today. No, but we were also like 
kind of, we were really good kids. Like we did not take advantage of the system either. When I think about it, like we actually were rule followers. We, you know, the work was important to us. I think we took it very seriously, probably looking back now way more seriously than I should have taken it. (laughs) Um, I am proud of it, but I, I really, I think I remember getting very intense and heated when people would forget their lines. (laughs) Like I was, I took issue with Joe, our co-star, because he wasn't even an actor. They hired a local kid who never acted let me before. Say, <laughs> our, our head writer, Graham Yost, immediately after Hey Dude, went and wrote the movie Speed and became a, you know, mm. he's a, a tremendous screenwriter. And him and the writing staff and, and uh, David Brisbane, who played, he was the only adult yeah. on the show, was like a trained Shakespearean theater actor. No, he's mm-hmm. terrific. So, like, we we could have shown up and been like, yeah, you know, we're gonna, you know, sleepwalk through this thing and just have fun, but we we couldn't because the people we were yeah. working around took it so <laughs> seriously that Christina, like, why do you guys care so much? Like, what <laughs> what is going on here? I guess this- we should care a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that was gonna be my next question because um, you did, I think, sixty five episodes. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, of of this show. And, um, you know, when you watch clips now, it feels very, um, I you know, it, hear it the, doesn't I, age. I don't want to hear it the does, adjective well, it, here. Okay, I'm, <laughs> here's the thing. I would say it doesn't age the way a lot of sitcoms do. Because, like, when you watch Saved by the Bell or something, like, there's a laugh track and it feels very, like, it feels very current. You know, it's very, like, fashion heavy and things like that. And your show kind of feels like it's, I don't want to say stuck in time, but oh. it's its a you very can. specific you style. You didn't like Christine's and it's a, fashion with her bowler a, tie and her <laughs> short did, shorts. You didn't like my pleated khakis with my, you know, belt <laughs> and the bandana around the well, neck? There's, there's, something, there's something very wholesome very about wholesome. it. Very wholesome. Very wholesome. And, um, but also like if you, if I didn't know that you were in it, I might say like, was this made in 1979 <laughs> instead of 89? Oh, this is so like, good. It's, it's, no, but it's, I, I have, I think also it, it has this kind of cult following, you know, for many people, it was such a specific time in their childhood or their teen years or their, you know, their youth. Um, and it's true. It was a it was a pioneering show. You know, we hadn't seen a show like that on Nickelodeon, right, when it came out. Um, but I wonder if, you know, kind of at the time, did you, <laughs> besides taking it seriously, did you feel like this doesn't feel authentic? Does it does it did it feel kitschy to you or it felt like we're going to do, you know, our best with these situations? And and I mean, it, it's fun. I think the writing was very strong, like it was. um you know, like a Sam and Diane kind of thing between myself and the Bradley character. There was, there was, there was, uh, the writing was really good for however bad the production looked, you know, (laughs) shooting on tape outside with multi-camera and no audience. Um, And very uh, flat artificial lighting too. Like they, they actually lit it outdoors, even though it was sunshine, there was still the artificial (laughs) light that made us look very 2D or something. Like we didn't quite (laughs) look like people. But Christine, Um, the storylines were as good as any of like my favorite sitcoms, honestly. Right. I give credit to to the writers, Scram and Lisa and and they got to, you know, what was great about it was because we were on location and the writer, there was always a writer who lived in the hotel with, like, they got to know us so well. So they would really write to what the, the things that were going on in our lives, the things that were important to yeah. us. If, if, if one, if someone loved, you know, music or art or something, they would write that into that character storyline, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I do feel like with all that said, David, there was still every episode, someone kind of had to end up in a horse trough <laughs> filled with water. Someone yeah, had to but, get, you know, like, look I, at it. I, I John Ritter. You, listen, I, some of my favorite <laughs> actors would fall down and they were, their pratfalls were, you know, <laughs> hilarious to me. And I learned that from, from Hey Dude. David, when you, you know, when you came to work um, on Blossom and it was, it was the end of season two. 
And then you came back in season right. three and obviously completed the series three, four, and five. Um, you know, my perception of you was that you were a very serious actor. Like, you seemed to have a lot of um, methodology to you. Um, you seemed a lot more... Um, skilled in many ways than like I felt, you know, I felt like a real sitcom actor and it was really my first show. Um, what was your kind of experience? You know, I've never gotten to talk to you about this. Like, what was your experience of, you know, working on our show in terms of like, this was what you did as an actor that also a lot of people then knew you from? I Well, I felt like the stakes were higher than anything else I had ever done, right? Um, NBC sitcom, that was already a hit. We were a show that like was never kind of never in the top 20, you know, like we st we were always struggling with ratings and like trying to get there. Um, but you're, you're right. We did have success. We had there was some notoriety surrounding us, but there were shows a lot more popular than us, you know, when we were up against Monday Night Football. But well, the Fresh Prince Blossom Hour on NBC was mm -hmm. was. Big, big time for me. I mean, and Christine yeah. and I, yeah. we always talk about, you know, our, our few years on Hey Dude, we we really felt like the cable children, you know, like. Uh, felt like the and so this. <laughs> children of television. <laughs> like the <Right>. forgotten. <laughs> Even at, right, Nickelodeon invited us to present at their own awards, but we were still like, Christine like says we felt like we were the staff. We were like the staff, we for sure. <laughs> we, but, they owned us in that way. <laughs> also, listen, the writing on Blossom also, I mean, Don Rio and that whole staff. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I mentioned this to you the other day, but Paul Witt uh, and Tony Thomas as amazing as they are. I mean, I can't even go back to how much they, uh, enter entertainment they created. They scared me. And I was uh, I was very intimidated um, most of the time on the on all all three years, but except when I was with you or with Michael or or doing the work. And luckily, most of my scenes mm -hmm. were with you, and we uh, we you know we were so close, and it all felt very comfortable. But you know the run throughs, the read throughs, and all that stuff. Uh, I, <laughs> I was I was terrified. <laughs> And Christine, can you talk a little bit about sort of what you did, you know, right after, you know, obviously you went on to have a really awesome and hilarious set of roles in, you know, some really, uh, really, really specific kind of humor. Um, and you really kind of, you know, really flourished and, and thrived in such a fun, you know, comedy atmosphere. What was the time kind of right after Hey Dude like? Well, I, you know, like David's, we, we sort of both had gotten into college, you know, that was the thing. Like we were in our college application process when the show came and <laughs> we had gotten into school and it was, Hey dude, you know, took us like, we, it was sort of like, okay, we're going to defer this and we're going to like, it, but then it was after two years of being on the show and already being out West, I was like, okay, I'm going to try LA for six months. I had met somebody, you know, during that period of time on the show, one of our directors, um, an actor that uh, our director introduced me to, and she was looking for a roommate. It, it was like, it just felt like the natural, you know, progression of let's just try it and see what happens. And I, I want to say I, 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 right away, I did, I just started booking episodic, you know, TV and Blossom was one of the first, mm -hmm. I would say three jobs <laughs> that I got. I, it was Saved <laughs> by the Bell. It was the final finale of the TV series, Dallas. The finale, like the series finale, <laughs> where I was with Joel Gray. I was working with Joel Gray wow. and Larry Hagman, and I like had no idea what I was doing. But Blossom was one of so it was really hitting an audition circuit like I had never done before. Um and reconciling that feeling of going from having a steady job where it was a paycheck and it was like, this is my life to now I'm living in LA. I have some money, so I don't have to get a job yet. I don't have to wait tables right now, but I, you know, I have some money saved. I can kind of live on this for a bit, but the in-between of the auditions and the waiting and the, mm. um, was really challenging. And I just found very quickly, you know, be, we joke because when I did Blossom, Dave, David and I were not speaking at that point. <laughs> I, I've apologized. <laughs> 
I just like to bring it up every chance I get. Um, no, you, I, like I said, I don't even remember you not speaking to me, but I did meet a couple of friends who were also guest actors that week who literally became like my closest friends in LA. Like it, 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 they're still to this day, my friends. And I, I sort of surrounded myself with this great network of, you know, unemployed actors that we were all going out and auditioning. Um, and there were many moments in time where it was like, you know what, maybe this is not the thing. There's just a lot of waiting around. I, I, maybe I just go to school and then I would get a little thing. I get a little job, a little nugget. And then, you know, honestly, mm -hmm. it was the real life Brady Bunch that was a transformative moment for me because it was a little thing. It was a very niche thing happening in LA, but it was the beginning of what this, this, you know, sort of Marsha Brady path for me, um, which ultimately was, you know, hugely successful. But I, I, I was not in the original real life Brady Bunch cast. I was filling in for Becky. Correct who I think was shooting a pilot or something. Like they were all getting so much attention. They were so funny and so good. Right. Um, like at the top of their game. And so I, my, 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 my roommate at the time said, did you read, they're looking for a Marsha Brady. Like my agents didn't even know about it. I had to call them and say, my roommate told me there's like a Marsha Brady role on stage, which I'd read all about. I'd read all about it in Chicago. Um, and so that was really sort of like the, the, this, a little bit of a turning point, getting to know that group of people. The 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 Brady Bunch film was soon after that. Um, they really had nothing to mm -hmm. do with it, but it was sort of this like entryway for me into that world of of her and and comedy. And and also um, for people who may not have heard me on your podcast um, at the time, Jill and Faith Soloway um, were the ones behind this real life Brady Bunch play. And what it was was actual scripts of the Brady Bunch that were recreated verbatim, verbatim on stage. So you would go on any variety of week or weekend um, and it would be a new episode. I saw I, I may have seen a couple. I went 29 yes. times in case anyone was <laughs> counting. But um <laughs> But, um, you know, at the time, like Andy Richter was in it and Jane Lynch. And it was just like this amazing group. And I remember you were new Marsha. Mm -hmm. That's what we called you because I went enough times that you weren't the original Marsha. And I remember when I went, I was like, oh, no, where is regular Marsha? <laughs> um, and then you were, you, it was a, it was a very big deal. It's a very big deal. Um, it was, I'm nervous for myself hearing for, that. Yes. But for those of us who had, you know, I mean, it was like a regular thing that I obviously went to. And so, um, and you were phenomenal. I mean, it was so fantastic, but it was a really, really special and, and interesting community. And, you know, in, in the days before cell phones and spin classes, we went to theater. It's a thing that even young people often did. So it was like a, a really, really big and, and awesome deal. Um, I wanted to ask both of you a little bit about nostalgia. And, you know, there's been many reboots uh, many reboots of shows literally from the era that we grew up and kind of were raised in. Um, and also, as as we spoke about, you know, um, I have interest, and David, it sounds like you have interest as well, in seeing where our characters would be, um, you know, today. And I, I wanted to just, though, ask you, because, you know, you specifically have all these guests on your podcast that specifically tap into um, nostalgia. Valerie pulled this definition of nostalgia. Nostalgia is a bittersweet emotion we experience when we think back to a past experience that was better than the life we're currently leading. That's from Psychology <laughs> oh, that's Today. Better. And, and that's a vague, that's ooh, a subjective term. That's actually sad. <laughs> well, so part of it, when I read that definition, part of it made me sad, but part of me made it interesting. Like I was interested about nostalgia in that framework because Sure, it's fun. Like, there's plenty of, of my childhood I don't want to remember. And sure, there's plenty about the fashion of the 90s that was fun and blah, blah, blah. But I wonder if, you know, either your kind of collective decision to do this podcast or the experiences you've had interviewing people has tapped into more than just like, oh, it's fun to remember. But gosh, that was a time that was a lot less complicated. Well, that I think that was our original idea for the podcast is that people our age are very nostalgic for uh, the 90s decade, which was the last decade before all the distractions came in, right? And um, and I 
found that like my teen kids were fascinated with the 90s. So I was, I thought like, if you can capture two different demographics, right? People our age that want to reminisce and look back and then younger people that want to know what it was like uh, shooting Blossom or you know, the guests that we've had on. Uh, they were all little like time capsules. And we had, we had David Faustino on last week and talking mm-hmm. about Married with Children. And it led to us discussing that there are no like blue collar shows anymore, right? I mean, the Russo family mm-hmm. was a very middle class, blue collar family. No one was rich. I mean, now it's like, uh, you know, it's the OC and the housewives and uh, everyone's rich living in, you know, $50 million right. mansions. And I feel like that's what our, our, at least our kids' generation worships that kind of wealth and wish fulfillment. And, right. uh, you know, so I, I feel like it might be time to, <laughs> the pendulum to swing back the other way and represent the rest <laughs> of the world. Yeah. And I think, um, Mayim, you, you hit the nail on the head when you, when you said, did, did, did it become a little bit more than just that trip down memory lane or that nostalgia, that memory of, oh yeah, I love that period of time or those, because we have that too, where we all will come together and say, oh, that one restaurant or that one place that, you know, um, but it has struck a nerve. I think I feel like there it's become this not, and I'm not selling it like it's this heartfelt, but it, I have felt personally going back to that period of my life and where I am now as a mother and a, you know, in my 51 years old and to look back at those, that period of time in the, in my twenties and see this, connective tissue between a lot of the people that we've interviewed, some of them really good friends that we've reconnected with, that is very meaningful. That is very, it, because it does bring you back to the, a time when we weren't all just texting each other. I would have to pick up the, mm. those friends that I talked about, you know, that I met on Blossom. We would all pick up the phone, call each other and say like, hey, what are you guys doing today? Do you want to play paddle time? Do you want to, and we would all get together we weren't behind screens. We weren't isolating. We it was it was a very um, communal time, and I think it's um, I, I I feel like it, it it feels nice to reconnect to that because particularly post pandemic and how we all just were shut ins. Um, I, I'm very good at it. I am very good at shutting myself in and away, and I love when no kids are home and I get to just be solo. But I feel like this has reinvited us back into connecting with people and never having done a podcast before. It, it it's just, it's just such a great way to connect with people in a very different, um, you know, format. No, that's, that's really helpful. Um, you know, as I sort of frame what nostalgia looks like, you know, um, for, for me, because so much, and not to get into childhood trauma, David, as you worried that we would, <laughs> but, you know, for me, when I, when I think back, you know, on the nineties, I was, uh, essentially, you know, I was I was working, you know, for the first portion, right? I graduated high school in 93. So I was two years out of high school when Blossom ended. Um, so, you know, for the first part of that decade, you know, my life was, um, you know, it was keeping an adult schedule, meaning we went to work every day and we were there all day. And, you know, at night, I mean, back in the day, like we had energy to do things at <laughs> night, you know, um, I used to go like, bourgeois pig. David, do you remember oh, bourgeois yeah, pig on Franklin? Of course. Like, you know, I used to just like go and like sit, you'd sit in a coffee shop and like I would read poetry, you know, <laughs> like that was a thing to do. Um, but, you know, there's also like a lot of the 90s that feel like there was a lot of complexity at that time in in my life. And I'm sure for a lot of your guests, I mean, I knew David, like we worked next to each other for years, you know, and we had the same agent when we were kids. Um, so it was also a time of like tremendous transition if you were a teen or in your 20s in that decade. You know, it was, we were, we were really first kind of understanding the larger impact of things like like the AIDS crisis, you know? Like I remember when Rock Hudson died, you know, I remember, and that was, you know, more more the transition from the 80s to the 90s. But, you know, the 90s was all the beginning of these conversations where adults were having to realize that, like, kids were actually having sex, 
Like, that's a thing that's happening. You know, it was kind of, there was this, this suspension of disbelief, I think, that moved, you know, through the 80s of like, everyone's still living kind of like, leave it to Beaver. And it's like, well, what do you think we're doing when we were asking for call waiting? You know, we're juggling dates. <laughs> like, things are going to happen. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit also, I don't want to say there was like a loss of innocence in the 90s, but part of the nostalgia, I think, is also that, as you said, David, it was like, it was the crux of a really interesting time socially. and. I know for both of you, you know, other interesting things happened after these shows that you worked on. Um, but I wonder also if you think about some of the complexity of that time and how that comes up in your podcast. We spoke to David Faustino about, you know, the, the 80s. And look, the time periods, the pendulum swims, swings back and forth, right? The conservative 50s led to the crazy hippie 60s. Um, and then the Richard Nixon law and order, you know, into the Reagan era of, you know, say no to drugs. And because of, like you said, the AIDS crisis, no one was having sex. It was very a family values. And then 1989, the show Married with Children uh, and the Fox Network launched with some very edgy, edgy material, right? In Living Color, Married with Children, The Simpsons. Um, but I feel like we're and also the the Tracy Ullman show where The Simpsons right, started mm -hmm. that featured a girl being raised by two men and people lost their minds. Tracy Ullman did a character where she had gay dads and people were like, what is happening? Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, look, the, the, I, I told David the other day, the Fox Network was going to live or die by these uh, this edgy material and was the country ready for mm -hmm. it coming out of that, you know, Nancy Reagan era. And I feel like we're in a similar time now where everything's so safe, everyone's so scared. You, I mean, you'll get canceled for saying anything. So isn't it time mm -hmm. now uh, for someone to come out with a show that just pushes the envelope a, a little bit? I mean, the comedians are the last ones that are really like doing that. Even they're scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look, the backlash, whether it's, I, I, I mean, even I, I don't want to go into it, but yeah, they, they get backlash, but um I feel like uh, the 90s was coming out of that very conservative time and was like, it's a fun, free expression before social media, before, you know, uh, YouTube and whatever the kids are distracted with today, you know, <laughs> it led to, you know, the Blossoms and, uh, you know, friends and all the, you know, the, the great entertainment, the great music that came out in the nineties. And I feel like everyone was happy in the nineties. It was, right? it was like <laughs> fashion wise, Christine, what do you think? I mean, you know, I, I think I was blissfully ignorant for that period of time in, because for me, it was also a lot of culture shock to go from Allen, uh, suburban Allentown, Pennsylvania to Tucson, Arizona, and then suddenly being in Los Angeles in uh, in a world, by the way, everyone was beautiful. It was like, it was not easy to wander around LA and like, it was just sort of like, I never felt like it was, oh, this is, you know, this is, feels so me and so home. I mean, it was so different from the way I grew up. I did not grow up with money. I grew up very, my, you know, very just middle America suburbia is the best way to put it. And, um, you know, fairly, fairly conservative. So I think even for me too, it was the branching away from my family life and my, you know, my parents making decisions on my own, you know, like, uh, um, it, so I, I think of it as that feeling of like becoming into my a, a, a womanhood in a way of feeling like, okay, I'm mm. now living on my own. I get to make these decisions. I don't know that my parents would agree with them. I'm forming and shaping mm. myself in a very different way. And growing up as like a good Catholic girl for a long period of time, like that's, that, that is kind of reconciling with a lot. I think of being able to, cause I was meeting so many incredible performers and entertainers and um, people in the industry. Um, so I mm -hmm. do feel like it, it was all of those things. Yet when I look back on it, I don't know if I felt it in real time, but I look back on it now and I was like, wow, big things, big changes were happening, Maya. And like you said, going from that teenage, teenager into young adult, you know, and, and um, you know, moving through that. Um, you both don't look your age. I mean, I feel like I look my, I feel like I look older than both of you, but I'm sure we all look 
pretty good to most people's assessment. <laughs> but um, I also want to mention, you know, you're you're both, I mean, you're grownups, and obviously I am as well. You know, my kids are 14 and 17. Um, and Christine, you, I believe you met your now husband in 99. So like at the end of the 90s, mm-hmm. right, you sort of began a relationship that has spanned. Can you each talk a little bit just about, I, I mean, for people who don't know, like how old are your kids? Like, what's that like? Also, Christine, you live in Westchester, which is where David's from. <laughs> I live in New York City, but we do have a place up in Westchester. Which oh, is not got far, it. I thought you yes, lived in Westchester. Okay, David got it. Was from. It's like she's returning to where the salmon spawned. She went back to where he was from. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Christine, you were at, you were, you were at my family's home, right? In Scarsdale. Uh, yes. So. I, yes, I, I, I sure was. Um, yeah, no, uh, it's funny, Maya, you said that but Ben and I met and I remember that was the year that we were, um, we had gotten engaged and and it was the big millennium. Remember the New Year's millennium <laughs> that all the power was going to, like, we were all oh, going to lose. The Y2K. It was like, the, like it was all <laughs> hell was going to break loose and we were all bracing for it. Were we really? Or I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but no, I remember that really, you know, it was very end of nineties, uh, into Ben and I have, um, a 21 year old daughter who's studying theater at Juilliard. Wow. She's in her, th- finishing up her third year. And we have a son who's finishing up his junior year in high school, uh, who will be 18. Oh. And, um, yeah in it, in it with that. Yet, you know, I mean, I For look sure. at where I said this a little bit to you on when you came onto our podcast, but that I look at where my, who my daughter is at 21 years old. And I flash back to my 21 year old self. Like, I, it, I mean, I still to this day, I'm like, I want to be like you, Ella, when I grow up. <laughs> I want to, <laughs> I want to be able to be so kind of firm in, and planted in my body and um, and who I am, and she's doing that at 21, and I think that's like sort of a gift of the generation she's grown up in, you know, um, and the, so many of the changes that have been going on. But I still, to this day, I'm still like I want, I would like to be like her. <laughs> um, and also, before we go on to David, I can't help but mention, and you talked about this on Drew Barrymore's show, um, you know, Drew, uh, also a really interesting example of someone who lived through so many, you know, aspects of a a personal life and a career life and um, huge element of nostalgia there. Um, But you did also mention that you had been separated and COVID brought you and your husband back together, which I think is remarkable because Jonathan and I literally started this podcast because we saw what was happening during COVID and that there was some sort of crisis happening everything was getting exacerbated, like the best of us, the worst of us, the hardest, the easiest. Um, I'm wondering if you can reflect, again, not from a gossipy perspective, but sort of on, you know, how COVID impacted you since, you know, we're connecting around podcasts and this podcast was born out of this sense of like, what is happening? Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's really interesting because prior to the, the, um, pandemic, we were, we were separated, we were living separately, but co-parenting, probably seeing each other sure. as much. We, he, you know, it was like, he was coming every morning to walk the kids to school. Like it was bringing me coffees. It was, we had this interaction. We were seeing theater together. We, I wouldn't want to let you go either, Christine. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Maya. <laughs> but we really were, it, it was, it, it, it re, when I, when I look back and, and I, I don't know that we would have made a decision um, to come back together in that way. But when it was sort of like, where are we all going to hole up? And we have this place mm. up in Westchester and it was getting out of the city. Everyone was afraid of elevators. And, you know, I mean, it was really crazy. Um, so it was, you know, kind of g- g- going back and we have nothing but time, nothing but time. <laughs> <laughs> because no matter what, we were going to be in each other's lives forever, no matter what, no matter what version mm-hmm. of that. And there needed to be repair around um, who we, how we were co-parenting, how we operated when it came to decisions about our children. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a period of time where we were able to just do some work because we we couldn't not. <laughs> we didn't have excuses. There was not a set right. to go visit. There was not a kid's, you know, school trip or a performance. Um, and I, it, it, it surprised me even. I mean, I really feel like being able to take that time to, um, 
to hold that space, to listen to each other, to take ownership of what the 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 tw- almost twenty years together had been, and mistakes I had made, yeah. mistakes he had made. Like it, it was a, it's a roller coaster ride, a long term relationship. Well, I just. I just think it's so amazing because I think so many people and David, I, I want to get to you because also, you know, I think we all have opinions about this. You know, people really learned a lot in those years <laughs> and in these past years, because anything you hated about yourself, you really had to look hard at. And if you really didn't like who you were married to or living with, it was going to become super, super <laughs> clear. So I think it's it was like a real it was such a litmus test, I think, for you know the human experience. And as we talk about on this podcast, you know, for those of us who had mental health challenges, Many got exacerbated, but also those of us who had experience with that could also clock it much sooner. Like I knew like, oh, my anxiety is up. And some people were like, what is this strange feeling? Why can't I eat, sleep or think? (laughs) It's like, oh, you're having problems that many of us have had since we're four. Um, (laughs) Right. The the whole COVID uh, experience, I've seen it break people up. I certainly have seen it it break up, uh, you know, relationships, but I, I have seen it absolutely bring people back together. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't want to name any a, anyone, but uh, you know, people who had it, 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 I don't know, it made it, it exacerbated everything, right? So if if you miss someone, you miss them deeply. If you didn't like someone, you understood it deeply, and. Uh, um, to answer your question, uh, yeah, my wife and uh, Jill and I were married in 99. Um, wow. We, yeah, we were together a few years before that. So yeah, I was 23 when I met her and, you know, to some of my good friends chagrin, I was, you know, th- they're good. You were yeah, off I the was market. Their good wingman <laughs> that was no longer. <laughs> You know, I wasn't going to help them uh, do their thing anymore. I was the first of my whole group <laughs> of friends. Do their thing. Do their thing. <laughs> no, I, Mayim knows. I mean, you know, in the. Oh, Mayim knows. Well, she knows all the, the things. In the 90s, whatever, if, you, if you're, you know, we, I could walk into a bar and my friends would not have to work so hard to strike up conversations. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't my thing. I listen. I met my wife at twenty three because I was, you know, I had had yeah. my share of whatever. But uh, careful, <laughs> I'm going to cancel you. No, my share of uh, the ladies dating. loved the ladies loved David. Let's just leave it at that, right? And I got I got sick of that by the time I was twenty three. I'm just that's that's all I'm saying. I was ready to meet like a real uh, someone that that would have a real relationship and. And mm-hmm. thank God I picked, you know, a person that's still my best friend, my greatest confidant that we laugh together. I mean, yeah, of, of course there's ups and downs. Didn't Jill think you were another actor from another show, though? <laughs> when you, didn't you tell that? She thought, she thought you were like, who was it? Scott Wanger. Scott yeah. Wanger. The, <laughs> our, our mutual friends set us up. Yes. And she thought she was going on a date with <laughs> the guy from Full House. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you Listen. obviously won her over. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've been compared to many uh, different actors that, you know, are in the same <laughs> genre, the same time. But um, uh, yeah, we've been married ever since. I have a daughter, uh, Hannah, who's 20, who's a sophomore at Tulane, studying business. My son, Casey, oh. uh, is a senior in high school. And like Christine was saying about Ella, Casey is everything that I, like, he's just better than I was at that age. You know, (laughs) he, I got cut from the basketball team in ninth grade. He's captain of his varsity team. He's uh, just the sweetest. He's he's an incredible, incredible kid. They they all are. I'm so blessed that way. He's He's committed to UT Austin where he'll, he'll be going in August. And then our our youngest Chelsea is thirteen, and she's like gangbusters, completely different than the other two, but with her own with her own agenda and her own talents and specialness, and she just makes us laugh every day. Um, David, I want to say something that's going to freak you out. Your youngest is how old? Thirteen. 
That's how old I was when I was cast in Blossom. No. Oh my gosh. And like, I'm, yes. And I'm thinking about, yes, I was cast when I was 13 years old. That's when Beaches came wow. out. That's when I met Don Rio. And when I think about the ages, you know, and Christine, you touched on it, you know, mine are 14 mm -hmm. and 17, right? And and I'm just thinking like, I, 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 I'm thinking about the ages of all our kids and thinking of us at all those stages, you know? And their world is obviously so incredibly different. That David still cannot believe that I was 13 when I was well, cast in Because we were like His making out in every episode, season... I was, yeah, by the time you oh, came boy. on, okay, let's do this. <laughs> by the time you came on the show, I was, I was 15. I was 15 or 16. And Steven Dorff had been on the show. Like he had been on, like I had to make out with him before I made out with you. <laughs> that was my first kiss. Like my first real kiss was Steven Dorff on oh. Blossom. I mean, I, it was, I, I didn't even know. I mean, I barely knew what I was doing in the universe at all. But yeah, and I remember when you came on, you were uh, you were a couple years older than me right. and that like I hadn't really dated, but I was like, oh, this is not someone my age. This feels like, you know, you were an older you were an older person to me. Yeah, I mean, there was probably a time where I was 18 and you were 16 and I could have been arrested for <laughs> yeah. court. whatever. <laughs> Anyway, speaking of trauma, okay, so, um, <laughs> no, but um, honestly, like, for for the situation that that we were in, you know, it, it always felt really good and fun and safe, and we had a very good camaraderie, but like I said, when I think of my kids, when I think of, you know, all of our kids going out into the world, the things that we were experiencing, I mean, it was so different. I would never, I, I can't even imagine dropping my kid at Ed DeBevix and being like, see you in seven hours. Right. Like, <laughs> no way to get in touch with you. That's right. right. Just see you later. I'm so appreciative um, of, of both of you being here. And um, it's just really been a pleasure to, to reminisce with you. And I think we found the best parts of nostalgia here. So um, thank you so much. And is there anything else we can plug in your life collectively or separately that you'd like to tell people about before we sign off? Christine has an Apple TV show you should talk about. <laughs> I was going to say, David, we can... David is also Christine's publicist. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we can plug our podcast. Hey Dude, the 90s called iHeart uh, uh, Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. That sounded great. Yeah, let me just plug one other thing. I'm in the, the new season of The Other Two on HBO Max. That is correct. Coming out in May. I have a role in a new series coming on Apple TV Plus that stars Patricia Arquette um, called High Desert. Oh. And um, I play her sister. It's coming on next <gasps> month and it's cool. And it's, they're, they're calling it a dark comedy. It's a, it's a little bit out there, but um, Patricia is. That is, is Matt awesome. Dillon. That's awesome Matt casting. Dillon's in it. Um, Brad Garrett, wow. uh, uh, Kira Donnell plays my brother, plays our brother. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a great time. And that's, um, that's coming on, uh, coming out in sometime in May. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being here and hope to see you guys soon. Thanks, Mayim. You're the best. <laughs> great to see you. <laughs> From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. And now she's gonna break down